It is time. Anyway, I'd like to welcome everybody here with a few announcements. First, uh, use the question and answer box for questions. Remember, there's an up, um, the like button that allows you to upvote any of the questions. And then I will be choosing among them to ask questions for uh, Dr. Kathleen Hogan, who uh, are a special guest today. I have a few questions I can ask her myself, but I much prefer to ask questions that you all, all tee up in Q&A. So that's part of your job. Um, the chat box you use for discussions, that's not for questions, for discussions. Um, this, as you notice, and all sessions uh, are being recorded. Be sure to check out today's posters on the Beck website. And remember that the climate action simulation game will be happening this afternoon. And Beck gratefully acknowledges Upright for sponsoring, Uplight for sponsoring our Tuesday sessions. We value their mission to motivate and enable energy users and providers to accelerate the clean energy ecosystem. At this point, I'm pleased to introduce um, Dr. Kathleen Hogan, um, who I'd like to say has, has been somebody I've known for many years and, and I've admired very much her work for many years. Uh, I drew on it when I wrote my book on energy efficiency, I drew on a lot of things she did. I may never have told her that. Uh, Dr. Hogan, Hogan has been serving as the Acting Undersecretary for Science and Energy at the US Department of Energy since the start of the, of the Biden administration on January 20th. Um, she's not gonna be in that job very much longer. We are very fortunate to get her at the very, very end of the job. Later today um, at 5 p.m., uh, Dr. Geraldine Richards, Richmond will be sworn in as the Senate confirmed undersecretary. She was confirmed on Friday. Uh, Dr. Hogan will continue on uh, at the DOE supporting Dr. Richmond's transition and at DOE most notably working to ensure the successful implementation of the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure deal. So she is going to have her hands extremely full. Um, she, she has served brilliantly, not only at DOE, but previously at EPA. She's led the development and implementation of many of the clean energy programs uh, and policies to cost effectively address global climate change, including many behaviorally oriented conferences. My personal favorite of all of those is uh, Energy Star. And I view her as a driving force behind that, uh, beyond, uh, behind, behind that. After opening remarks, there'll be plenty of time for a question and answer. So let me go on to uh, Dr. Kathleen Hogan and let her start. Well, thank you so much, Jim, and, and truly it's a pleasure to be with all of you today and really looking forward uh, to the conversation that we can have. Um, just up front, um, thanks to ACEEE, CIE, and CPAC at Stanford uh, for this really important uh, event at what is a, a really critical time when the role and understanding of human behavior is so clearly integral to our ability to achieve this low carbon future. Uh, and, and protect the health of our planet. You know, this, this is an amazing point in time, again, to be having uh, this event, you know, as world leaders have repeated, and as you've heard this past week at COP26 in Glasgow, we are truly in a code red for humanity. And from day one of this administration, our president, Pre President Biden has committed to a whole of government approach to tackling the climate crisis, the administration hit the ground running with the President's Climate Summit in April, announcing three significant climate goals for the United States, including a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030, reaching 100% clean electricity by 2035, 
and achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The urgency of the president's sweeping strategy to meet climate change head on represents the strongest ever federal commitment to addressing the climate urgency, emergency. And what we do now and or don't do now, I think we all know will have generational implications. You know, the good news on this front, as we're having this conversation, this wide ranging discussion, is that combating climate change offers one of the biggest economic opportunities in a generation. We have the opportunity to grow the pie by orders of magnitude with the clean energy build out and create jobs as we protect our climate. President Biden is quintupling, quintupling down on the investment in the clean energy economy. All told, the twin bills in the Build Back Better agenda will invest nearly $800 billion in clean energy and climate action. Truly a historic amount. And now an historic moment with the passage last Friday with the 1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure deal, the bid. So this investment does translate into jobs, solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, that can significantly address our ability to get electrons onto the grid and reduce carbon and other greenhouse gas pollution. And it means manufacturing jobs in EVs, batteries, storage, jobs in carbon capture, geothermal and clean hydrogen that um, actually demand the skills that traditional energy industry workers already have. But I think the other thing we wanna be uh, very thoughtful about, right? This is not just a goal to replace one industry with another. It's using the enormous talent within our communities to build out more diversified, resilient, and energy secure economy. An economy that can address longstanding inequities and create opportunities for everyone. One that can offer stability, sustainability, and safety to all and everyone who wants to be part of this. So this optimism for the future right now is on full display in Glasgow at COP26. And it's been made clear to the world that America's back and, uh, and more committed than ever to accelerating a climate action globally and, and here at home. So where in all of this does the Department of Energy fit in? Uh, as our secretary has said, uh, we are the solutions agency. And much of DOE's work is centered on accelerating and delivering on the climate and clean energy agenda. You know, our focus is on building out clean energy to add capacity to our grid and ensure affordable, reliable, clean electricity and other energy for all Americans. You know, since January, we have mobilized over $2.4 billion in what the DOE does, RDD and D clean energy, carbon reduction technologies, again, from solar and wind that are ready to scale to emerging technologies like hydrogen and new energy storage technologies. You know, it's been a pleasure for me uh, it, since the uh, administration uh, began uh, to act in this undersecretary role for science and energy and see sit on the front uh, row to view a lot of the efforts you know, um, it's been a new vantage point for me to look across our Office of Science, uh, the largest funder of physical sciences in the nation, uh, and to look across our applied energy programs, efficiency and renewable energy, electricity, Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, and nuclear energy, all responsible in their own way for driving progress in clean power, transportation, industrial processes, and with oversight, of course, of our 13 national labs and the amazing work that all of those scientists and engineers do uh, to advance the frontiers of science and energy. And you know, when we look at the programs the DOE runs, uh, again, it's great to see um, what they are, their capabilities uh, and what they can do as part of this transition. Uh, and again, quite a diverse portfolio of things from our weatherization assistance program bringing uh, clean energy technologies to low-income households, now having served um, 7 million or more such households um, over the decades, uh, really working to reduce energy burden, reduce energy costs. Our federal energy management program that's working with our, uh, which is working across our federal agencies 
uh, to bring cutting edge technologies uh, to, uh, the, to the federal government, which is the Americans, uh, which is America's largest landlord. Uh, interestingly here in 2020 alone, uh, FEMP helped uh, agencies invest over $2 billion in energy efficiency. You know, our solar energy program is doing uh, a whole bunch of amazing work, but something to call out is the work they're doing to reduce permitting costs and bringing solar solutions to more locations with what's a new, with a solar app uh, as part of our goal to reduce solar costs to two cents a kilowatt hour by the end of the decade. You know, another program to call out that not everyone hears about is our Indian energy program bringing clean energy solutions to tribal nations and upping the administration's game in tribal consultations to ensure that the solutions meet community needs. Uh, and then we have our Better Buildings Partnerships, which is taking uh, climate solutions head on with a new challenge called the Better Climate Challenge to spur deep carbon savings across entities of uh, many, many, many different types. And you know, I run through these types of programs at the Department of Energy. I think the common theme here with the programs I just mentioned is they all engage people and communities in climate and energy solutions. Uh, and as we look forward and what we will be doing uh, now that the infrastructure bill is a reality uh, and we still have an ongoing conversation uh, in Congress on uh, adding on the reconciliation effort, this really brings a historic level of additional funding to these efforts, greatly increasing their ability to deliver on our goals uh, for investments, jobs, and providing benefits to all communities. And they bring a very large down payment toward our 2050 net zero energy goals. Here, I wanna highlight one other uh, initiative uh, of this administration, the uh, Energy Urshots Initiative, which uh, seeks to cut costs uh, for really critical energy technologies that can unlock our clean energy future and drive innovation uh, in a decade or so. I think many of you are familiar with uh, the investment the US made back in the 60s uh, to get to the moon uh, called the moonshot, uh, something that requires an all hands on deck approach, leverages our capabilities and launches us towards a solution for a big, bold, but achievable challenge that we can all focus on. And I think you know, we know when President Kennedy gave his famous speech in 61, he didn't quite know if we'd actually get it done, uh, much less than within the decade, but he did set the goal and then he backed it with historic investments in research uh, and engineering. And within three years, we had more than quadrupled funding uh, for the space agency, NASA, uh, and this is really what we're doing with the energy earth shots as well to spur a new set of clean energy technologies where we really need them uh, by 2030. Uh, so we've already got many of the tools we need uh, for our clean energy transition and meeting our climate goals, but we are missing a few critical pieces in this puzzle. You know, there's a, the energy, uh, International Energy Agency, for example, found that only six out of 46 clean energy technologies are on track to meet the Paris Agreement. Uh, a, and a big barrier to deploying the 40 uh, that are left is cost, bringing the cost down dramatically. Uh, and that's where this Energy Earth Shots Initiative really comes in. So we've announced a goal uh, uh, to bring clean hydrogen, the cost of clean hydrogen down by 80% to a dollar per kilogram in a decade, which would make it possible for long haul trucks and even big steel plants to run without producing carbon pollution. And then we've announced a second energy or shot on long duration storage, uh, which aims to cut the cost of energy storage systems that have a duration of 10 years or more, cut the cost of those systems by 90% or more which can then let our clean grid that um, the, the electricity that we have at one time of the day actually also be available at uh, other times of the day, really helping us get to 100% clean grid. Uh, and then last week at, um, at COP, our secretary announced our third energy earth shot called the carbon negative shot. 
to achieve durable and scalable carbon dioxide removal at less than $100 per net ton, really going after the negative emission uh, strategies uh, that we need on top of everything else uh, that we're doing. So we know that these are difficult goals, but they really are necessary. And uh, they are the types of goals that it'll take all stakeholders at the table uh, to be uh, actively pursuing uh, to bring the cost down and then being able to utilize these uh, in the period from 2030 to 2050 to meet our carbon uh, and well, global climate change protection goals. Uh, the other thing I'd like to highlight here is that in addition to this commitment to research and development, we um, have a very strong commitment to addressing the energy inequities that have long plagued our communities, many of our communities. You know, the EPA has recently affirmed for us what we've known, that there is a disproportionate public health impact on low income, particularly black and brown communities from both the direct combustion of fossil fuel and from the harmful effects of climate change. And we also know that communities that have provided for the energy needs of this country for decades are now going to be on the front line of change in the transition to a clean energy economy. And they deserve support uh, as we go through this clean energy transition. So uh, the department, the administration are prioritizing environmental justice and equity to ensure that the energy transition does not disproportionately impact disadvantaged communities as well as brings the benefits of clean energy investments to those uh, that need it most. So now all of this doesn't just happen, of course, <laughs> by running successful science and engineering programs. It really happens when through societal embracement of lower carbon solutions. It happens when changes to behavior happen among millions, if not billions of people worldwide. You know, it happens when people no longer hesitate to purchase a new electric vehicle because of range anxiety about finding a charging station, or when it is just as easy for homeowners to purchase electric heat pumps for their heating and cooling or water needs as the fossil alternatives, or when people can have easy access to reliable and resilient power or electricity, when leaders can use their leadership and purchase power to drive change and then when communities can engage in efforts to chart their economic and clean energy future. This is, as I said, um, when we started a, a historic moment, a uh, really historic moment to get it right and to address the climate crisis with new solutions, but really pairing this hand in hand with the engagement of the people and the communities that need to embrace and propel these solutions forward making sure that the clean energy choice is the easy choice and that it betters our economy and our communities. So that's really the message I wanted to leave here today, just really stressing the importance of what it is you are all doing. So again, I, I thank you for having me here with you today. Um, we urgently look forward to what we can all do to speed up the adoption of the climate solutions, really leverage the amazing work you all are doing and, and thinking about as you gather for this event uh, and really working together to deliver on our goals. And, and as uh, Jim teed up at the beginning, I, I'll also just take a moment uh, to uh, congratulate uh, Jerry Richmond coming to the Department of Energy uh, this afternoon at 5 p.m. and taking over as undersecretary uh, and leading, continuing to uh, lead the charge on many of these uh, science uh, and energy issues. And as Jim said, I will be there supporting her as uh, she comes in as our confirmed undersecretary and am so excited uh, for that. So again, thank you um, all for your time and I look forward uh, to some of your questions. Great, well, thank you. Uh, let me follow up on some of the ending points of your, your comments. Um, a lot of what your comments were and that we're hearing from the press is, is, is the technology solutions, uh, the, the moonshot type of technologies. Could you uh, expand a little further on the role of the DOE, the Build Back Better, the infrastructure budget for the behavioral and the social science efforts and research? And along with that, you might talk about what DOE is planning to do in promoting behaviorally relevant approaches 
to decarbonization of the economy? Yeah, so when, um, I mean, I think as I, you know, the people side of this is critical. And I think, you know, it's time for us to be really actively engaging uh, with the people and the communities that need to embrace these technologies and take them to the next level to be part of the fabric of, of their lives. You, I think what the, what the infrastructure deal, the bipartisan infrastructure deal does for the department provides um, over $60 billion uh, worth of money uh, to advance any number of things from building energy codes uh, to demonstrations uh, for the new ways of, of doing things with hydrogen and battery supply, uh, but really the things that can become the economic engines for communities across the country. And I think that's a big part of what we need to uh, get our arms around from a behavioral way as well. How is it we can work with these communities to help them see what it is they can embrace and adopt and help chart their economic future uh, that is part of this clean energy transition? I mean, how is it we can help uh, the, the communities that have been facing um, you know, some of the, the plant closures, the mine closures, uh, about what the future looks like for them in a new clean energy world. Um, so there's a lot that needs to be done, I think, in, in helping communities come together, chart their course, understand their assets, uh, the new world before them. And uh, we will certainly be looking to do uh, a lot of that, uh, you know, because, you know, again, this is the time to get it right. And it really is about the interplay of the environment, the economy, the jobs. That's, that's what will be a successful transition that'll get us toward our climate goals. Well, that's very encouraging to hear, but, and particularly with the role that you'll be playing in implementing all of these things. I, I believe that it, it sounds like it's apt to be a balance between the technologies and the behavior and the policies. Uh, let me turn to a little bit different front. Uh, uh, Something is challenging for many of us. Um, this is such a politically polarized time, right? Right now, I don't have to tell you that or anybody, anybody else in this audience. What do you think it'll take to deliver on this promise of the programs you're describing in this politically polarized cultural environment, where? you're gonna have a lot of pushbacks and a lot of misinformation um, bubbling around there. Uh, how you can handle it? And you being oh. DOE and the whole Biden administration, I believe. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, um, I think on one hand, um, let's just start with um, the bill that has passed, right? It's the bipartisan uh, infrastructure deal. I think um, it's very exciting uh, to be uh, afforded the opportunity to put these dollars to work uh, in the way that we're talking about, uh, and, I th and to be doing it as the result of bipartisanship um, in the Senate and in the House. Uh, we certainly uh, will also see uh, the reconciliation um, bill uh, coming along, a lot of great conversation and negotiation going on there. We're hearing very positive things, but we'll just start with uh, the infrastructure bill right now. Uh, I, you know, I think it, again, it affords us the opportunity to do very important things um, to help communities across the country. I mean, I think what we really want to do is, is, you know, it's, it's, got to be about rebuilding our economic capabilities around the clean energy future. And I think so much work went into what's in this bill. I mean, this is months and months and months of people looking to see what types of solutions you wanted to come through uh, with this type of funding support. And now the opportunity is to put it to work and is to put it to work in real communities and to do it as quickly as possible so that people can start to see uh, you know, the activity that comes with it and the benefits that will follow. Um, you know, you know, I think the other challenge we will have 
is, you know, you want these dollars to be put to work really quickly so you can get those benefits. At the same time, you know, this is a historic amount of, of money to flow through the, um, the federal government for these purposes. You also want to get it really, really right. Um, and so, and of course, getting it right, as we know, can take a little longer um, than just moving money quickly. Um, so, um, so we will be working to balance that. But I think it's a big focus on the benefits that can come with these dollars. And it's the jobs and manufacturing capabilities and opportunity for the US to be a real leader on these clean energy solutions. I mean, those aren't new messages, but I think the um, infrastructure deal uh, really puts us in a place to lean in on so much of that. Um, let me talk about something that's out of the DOE. And you can decide whether this is out of the out of your territory or not. But in the discussion to build back better, one of the hanging points right now is is paying for it, and you you see the political pressure of don't raise don't raise uh, corporate tax or whatever. It seems like now's a time where a uh, carbon tax would be able to, to help cover that, but I don't hear a lot of discussion of that. Is there a significant discussion of the possibility of a carbon tax from the US? I would like to see it as, as a questioner. Also, I would like to see it on uh, worldwide basis, but at least on the US, is that, that on the cards or is that dead right now? You, you, yeah, you don't hear that conversation in Congress right now. And I think, you know, there was a program uh, people were talking about, which was um, the Clean Energy Payment Plan, which was, you know, again, not a carbon tax, but it was a way to um, help utilities get toward a lower carbon intensity. So, you know, focused on the utility sector uh, and, a, and, a, and a, a way to help with that uh, decarbonization strategy which um, also just didn't get enough support in Congress uh, to, uh, you know, to make it into the, the reconciliation bill that is now being discussed. I mean, I do think the carbon tax concept was raised by several in on the Hill. I mean, it wasn't like that it got no conversation at all, but, um, but not enough that it um, made major progress uh, in the overall discussion. You know, I think, you know, I think the other things that are very interesting in the reconciliation bill um, that, you know, has a big human element to it is the tax credits and tax credits of many different types, right? Some for uh, industry, if industry is trying to build out uh, new manufacturing capabilities, but a lot in the um, homeowner space as well around, um, you know, both improving your home, electrifying your home, as well as bringing, uh, or, you know, using distributed energy uh, around your home. So uh, be interested, you know, so a lot of important and uh, good work to be done there as well. Before you have to leave, and I know <laughs> in the last hours of your job, you have some real severe time constraints, but I want to make <laughs> sure you, one of the questions that are not in here, um, there's a lot of practitioners, um, the policymakers, the students, there's the academics in the audience. How can they get involved in DOE's programming more effective? How can they help? How, what would you like to see from the type of people who might be listening here to help move this forward and get involved in the, the, the DOE efforts to be, as you describe it, the problem solving agency. Right, so we, you know, there, there's many ways uh, to get involved. Um, I guess some of the ones um, sort of off the top of my head are, you know, there is gonna be a lot of um, engagement that the department is going to be doing in many different ways as we move out on the implementation of this bipartisan uh, deal. We are going to be um, working to engage people uh, at the local level. We will be putting out requests for information about how to do the work that we're doing and do it well. Uh, we will be um, putting out solicitations based on that information. We will be looking for people that can help us review those solicitations to make sure that we uh, can pick the ones with the highest likelihood of success 
Um, so there's lots of ways to uh, engage. I mean, one is sort of stay tuned, uh, I guess, to um, our blasts on sort of what is happening when. But certainly, if people want to volunteer to be part of our review panels and, and be at our uh, review meetings, we would just love to have uh, all the engagement we can get. Because uh, again, I think you know the Energy Earth Shots is sort of an interesting um, you know example of uh, an all hands on deck need that we have now in the technology space. But we really have an all hands on deck need right across the board, uh, particularly with the the human side of it, uh, the people and uh, and our communities. Thank you. Um... And I'm counting on you to tell me when I'm going to leave because I'm you have to leave because I'm going to keep asking you questions until you say say uncle or aunt so I'm not sexist on this. Um, <laughs> one other um, tough issue: the power of misinformation has been corrupting our ability to make progress, often with with markets, with technology solutions, with behavioral solutions. Uh, you look at outside the energy area, in the COVID area, you see the power of misinformation. Uh, is there any big picture of strategy that DOE is thinking about and you've been considering in order to, to um, deal with the power of misinformation as we move towards a, a clean energy transition? Well, you know, I think, um, you know, as a federal agency, what we can do, and I think we're, we're trying to do it, is, um, is put a lot more energy effort into communicating what are fairly complex issues, right? So um, we are trying, um, to take what it is we do and put it out in a way that is um, that you can break it down into its pieces and explain it uh, to lots of different people uh, in a very straightforward way. So I think that helps, right? When you've got the credibility of the, the federal government, uh, at, you know, sort of providing uh, information that's uh, fairly easily understandable about what the issues are and what the solutions are. And then I think it is what we need to do is, is to make it work. You know, I think we, um, the other thing we will be looking at very closely um, with a lot of energy behind it is what we need to do around the infrastructure bill to maintain, you know, to, to make sure all the money is spent in a very effective way. Uh, I think, you know, when you look back at the last time the department had this type of funding uh, at a lesser level, the Recovery Act, there was huge concern that that money um, could get misused, abused, uh, and it turns out um, no. It really, it really, um, you know, the the government can really put these dollars to work and do it effectively in programs like weatherization, uh, as an example. So, uh, I think you know, if the government can come to the table and uh, really demonstrate the money is a not only is effectively managed as it's being put to work. Uh, to help uh, build out this clean energy transition, uh, as well as make information readily available and easy to understand that that's, um, that's all a big part of what we need to do. Thank you. Um, from, from your perspective, um, there, there's gotta be some challenges. That, there's some wonderful goals but goals, goals are, are different than outcomes. That's right. uh, what are those uh, challenges you feel that most constrain the rate and the impact of the climate responses at the federal level? And which of those do you think that it's going to be, um, you're looking for creative thinking around for people to help you to figure out how to, how to address those challenges? Yeah, I think. Um... I mean, I, I, I think you know, trying to break this down um, to people, people in different communities, people that have um, sort of different, um, you know, situations in which their their community is, and trying to help them understand some of the you know opportunities of the future, I think is uh, is one of the big challenges. Uh, you know, I think for as as the department thinks about what it needs to do. It needs to be much more engaged at the community level 
to be able to help with this transition. And it also needs to be more, um, needs to be very effective at engaging communities in what have been historically very difficult issues around building out new infrastructure, right? So we do need new transmission lines in this country, right? And we do need new manufacturing facilities in this country. Um, and those things bring great benefits. They don't always bring great benefits in the exact place they're being located. Um, so we've got to figure out how to navigate what, what are um, very difficult, um, which can be difficult um, conversations at, at, a, at a local level. Uh, I see that as, um, I mean, the, as we know, this isn't new now. This is what we've all been living through in one way um, or another. So, um, so that yeah. So that's what we will be looking uh, to do. You know, as we look at the infrastructure bill and the build out of what we need to do. I mean, sort of a little closer to home. We will be hiring a lot of people to manage sixty billion dollars. So we have the opportunity now to bring in um, the expertise in these areas in which I'm talking about uh, to really help us. You know, effectively do what it is we need to do. Uh, and, and to your point about goals, I think the other thing is, uh, yeah, there'll be a lot of interim milestones along the way so that we, uh, we know we're on course with, uh, with people and targets uh, and engagements, uh, et cetera. So I think I, I do have to run, um, unfortunately. Yeah. I've been told that I'm gonna be in trouble if I don't let you go. <laughs> uh, so thank you. This has been an absolute delight and best wishes in the next phase of what you're doing in, in DOE and I'm gonna keep watching. So thanks again. And Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you so much.